Okay, so I've uh, started recording and uh, I'm going to go ahead and dive in here. <clears throat> Again, this is going to be a um, pretty high level overview, kind of introductory cybersecurity concepts. And uh, um, this, these, are, these are things that you could, you know, if, if you're um, teaching a high school level class on cybersecurity, th these are concepts that you could probably spend, you know, a couple of lessons covering. I I'm going to go through a couple of slide decks fairly quickly today. Um, and, and um, sort of give the voiceover for, for some of the slides, but, but um, of course you're welcome to use, these, uh, use this content uh, any way you'd like to. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, um, usual overview of weekly workshops, uh, once a week, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. recorded. These are all recorded, so I'm recording right now. And this, this will be available. Um, on the virginiacyberrange.org website under the uh, outreach, to, there's a um, button for, for community and that's where this will be, uh, will be hosted. Um, today I'm not going to do any cyber range stuff at all. I'm not going to log into the range or do anything with the, with the uh, exercise area. Um, I'm just going to talk high level cybersecurity introductory concepts. Um, and uh, as always, if you want to see a particular topic discussed during, these, uh, during one of these weekly sessions, then then send me a note uh, or send a note to contact at virginiacyberrange.org and we will, we will get it worked in. Um, we only have these planned for a couple weeks out. <clears throat> um, but we got lots, of, I have lots of content that I can cover. And so I, I'm gonna, today I'm gonna do this sort of high level introductory stuff. And then next week I'm gonna start delving into um, some cryptography, uh, you know, sort of introduction to cryptography. And then we'll talk about cryptography for a couple weeks and do some hands-on stuff with, with crypto maybe look at some CTF challenges with, with crypto. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I always like to start with, with recent news. Anytime I'm, I'm uh, t talking to students um, or, or teachers who are gonna be talking to students. And um, so let me switch over to um, <clears throat> web browser. <clears throat> and this is what I do in class. I'll pull up, a, you know, if I, if I take the time beforehand, I'll, I will um, put, you know, I'll throw a news story into a slide or also just pull up the web page and, and generate a discussion with the students. And this is pretty helpful to, to you know, to help them wrap their brain around how um, cybersecurity concepts, you know, directly apply to everyday life. Um, this is a story that was in the news, I guess, yesterday, September 24th is the byline here. I just saw it this morning. Um, Mitsubishi recalls 60, 68,000 SUVs, right? So it's a, it's a vehicle recall. Vehicle recalls are not unusual. But this particular recall is um, due to software, right? So this is not a hardware failure. Uh, it's not a it's not a door latch that doesn't work properly, or a or a, a brake pad that that is is not uh, functioning. This is um, due to software, a recall due to software that is um, that controls the braking system, <clears throat> uh, and so braking system pretty important, right? And and uh, you know, it used to be that when you pressed on the brakes, that was all uh, um, a physical system. You know, uh, <clears throat> your foot pushing on an, uh, you know, a, a brake pedal that activated a cylinder that pushed brake fluid directly to brake pads that caused the car to stop. And now we have software in the loop. So we have you stepping on a pedal that might, may or may not be directly connected to the braking system, but maybe connected to, it may be just a, sort of a switch that is um, causing um, that's causing the, the uh, brake fluid to get pumped to the, to the, through the system to the brake pad. So, so software is important, becoming more and more important. important and, um, and this is a very good example of a cyber physical system. And here you have a situation where, um, you know, poor software is, is causing, in this case, you know, so we talk about, we're, we're going to talk about high level concepts with regard to cybersecurity today. And we're going to talk about the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And um, <clears throat> so this particular issue has nothing to do with confidentiality or integrity, but it's very much an availability issue, right? So we have um, the, the availability of our brakes being impacted by poorly written software or a glitch in the software. And that to me is a cybersecurity challenge. <clears throat> um, here's another, this, this, when I saw this, you know, this is a cyber physical system, IOT system. And this reminded me of a recent news story. This is from um, this past summer. Yeah, so the middle of June, 15 June, 2018. Unbreakable smart lock devastated to discover screwdrivers exist, right? So this, the, the, the headline itself is kind of a joke. 
<clears throat> but if you look at this thing, this is a uh, this is a smart uh, lock. Um, smart in that you open it with your um, with Bluetooth device, right? So you open it with, with a with a smartphone, and um, so this thing was was marketed this summer and supposedly um, uh, unhackable. And was, and immediately when this thing came out, people um, noticed that on the back there was this um, this uh, sort of opening right that you could slip a a tool into like a screwdriver, <clears throat> and then um, and then when you turn it, the whole back of this thing comes off. <clears throat> and once the back comes off, you see there's a battery inside here. I don't know if you can people can see this or not. <clears throat> there's a battery in here, and there are screws inside the, the interior of this thing. And if you take those screws out, the whole thing comes apart and the hasp is opened. Right. So it's it's this smart, you know, it's the super secure smart lock um, that you can open the back of it with a screwdriver and then, you know, maybe use a flathead screwdriver, maybe you need two screwdrivers, right? Use a flathead screwdriver to take this back plate off and then take your Phillips head screwdriver, take out the screws, whole thing sort of flops open and you, uh, you're left with it with, you know, the hasp just hanging there and completely, completely terrible from a security point of view, right? And <clears throat> so that was the first thing that people noticed about this thing. Quickly, though, it was discovered that not only was it physically insecure, but the, um, the even the security of the wireless system and the software system was, was terrible, right? So turns out that there's no, uh, it's not using any um, security on the wireless channel between your smartphone and the device so that anybody can eavesdrop on the cryptographic token that's used to authenticate the authorized user with the device. And so anybody who can eavesdrop on that token can record that token and then replay it back and get access to the lock. Um, another vulnerability turns out that anybody who owns one of these can create a, um, uh, what does he say down here? He, so, so, you know, one of three major flaws I talked about, one, one of them is um, um, <clears throat> valid token, right? So anybody who owns one of these things um, basically pairs their smartphone with the device and, and in the process you get, a, you get this token and that's the token that, that um, <clears throat> that's the token that, um, sorry, I'm getting alerts on my screen that is used to authenticate the user with the device. And, and it turns out that if you just have one of those tokens, you can use that token on any of these devices, any of these smart locks. So if I, so anybody who owns one of these particular brand of smart locks can now use that, that token on their, on their smartphone to open any one of the, any of these uh, uh, same smart locks. So pretty terrible from a cybersecurity standpoint, kind of a funny story when it came out, but not funny for people who paid a hundred bucks for this, uh, for this smart lock that turns out is, is woefully unsecure, but it's it sort of, um, you know, <clears throat> this is great to sort of highlight this, um, you know, the challenge in all these smart devices these days are that th there's this rush to market. So, you know, you want to get your smart lock on the market before anybody else does because smart things are now popular, smart uh, speakers and, and, um, you know, smart cameras and smartphones and et cetera. And, um, <clears throat> and so if you can get yours to market before anybody else, then, then you'll get the biggest market share. And um, so lots of times the security is not considered uh, before the device is marketed. Um, okay, <clears throat> so that's, that's uh, what I thought was kind of interesting recent news. Okay, I'm gonna um, cover, uh, again, I'm gonna quickly cover two different um, slide decks. One of them is <clears throat> from the Cyber Basics. Con whoops, sorry about that. One of them is from the Cyber Basics content uh, in the Cyber Range Courseware repository. So if you go to Courseware repository and uh, type in Cyber Basics and then go to Module One, there's this. Um, module One is the Introduction to Cybersecurity and Virtualization, and then Lesson One is Introduction and Overview Overview of Cybersecurity. So I'm going to start with that slide deck, and it covers some basic terminology and, um, again, high-level overview of some cybersecurity uh, um, concepts. And then I'm also going to talk about a um, 
a slide deck that is on cybersecurity. This actually should say cybersecurity concepts. Cybersecurity concepts that is a um, is a um, set of, of concepts that that are um, tied to um, an, an NSA and NSF sponsored program that that uh, teaches students and teachers introductory cybersecurity. And the concepts are, I think, pretty good. Um, something that is use, useful, worth sharing with students. And um, that that slide deck is not in the course repository right now, but it will be, um, I'd say, by the end of this week. So, um, so it's not there right now, but it'll be available soon, uh, as soon as we can get it posted. And so for folks that are uh, on here live, it's not there yet. For folks that um, that are listening to the recording, it, it may be there uh, by the time you watch this recorded session. Okay, so I'm going to start first with <clears throat> the slide deck that it, uh, already exists in. Oops, I'm going to go to the top of this one. <clears throat> I'm going to start with the slides that already exist in the course repository. And again, the way you get to this slide deck is. If you're on the, the home page, uh, go to Courseware and you can go to Cyber Basics, Cyber Basics course. And uh, module one is Introduction to Cybersecurity and Virtualization. And the lesson one is Introduction to an Overview of Cybersecurity. And this is the slide deck that I'm, uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, for the next few minutes. And again, this is high level overview. I use this as a first uh, kind of introduction when I do uh, a, um, a teacher camp um, during the summertime. <clears throat> um, okay, so I, I like to start out with learning objectives. This is pretty common. Uh, um, I, I imagine high schools do this. This is certainly something that, that I use in, in uh, undergraduate and graduate college courses. Um, so <clears throat> upon completion, we should be able to define cyberspace and cybersecurity. It's kind of important if you're teaching a cybersecurity class. Um, understand the basic security principles of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Describe some common threats to InfoSec and then understand some security fundamentals. <clears throat> so this slide just sort of, um, uh, you know, sets the stage for why we need to drill into this stuff. And, and you know, this slide is certainly replaceable with things like um, recent news stories, right? So this, this slide refers to um, some, some sort of high profile, um, you know, cybersecurity threats or compromises over the last several years. The one at the top is Stuxnet. Um, so Stuxnet was a cyber physical uh, system attack in which um, some uh, Iranian uh, centrifuges that were used to produce uh, um, nuclear weapons uh, were, were um, d d damaged through uh, through software, right? So this is physical devices that were damaged through software, and this is attributed to the United States. Um, but that's that's uh, it was certainly a, a big story in 2010, and it's been a, a, in the infosec community. It's still been a, a pretty uh, a big story. Um, <clears throat> the Mirai botnet is, is uh, uh, the second story there. That's about a um, large uh, distributed denial of service attack that was um, conducted using Internet of Things devices. So it was mostly IP cameras that were compromised and this, uh, this malware was installed on them and, um, and it caused uh, um, deny, to distributed denial of surface attacks to, to be uh, initiated against some various uh, targets. So that was kind of the first big, um, uh, you know, Internet of Things related piece of malware. Um, and that's, that's you know, the, the Internet of Things is, is becoming, you know, we're moving past computers under our desks to, you know, everything is part of the Internet. And so as we, um, as we increase the number of devices on the Internet, those kinds of attacks, I think, are easier to, to pull off because now you have lots more things that you can compromise. Uh, third story there, Sony. Um, this that was a pretty, um, you know, the, the Sony hack um, was was a pretty uh, well known attack against uh, uh, Sony Picture Studios, and it all 
sort of relates back to the North Koreans and the uh, movie about, uh, um, you know, the attack, the, uh, some comedy movie about, uh, you know, the, an assassination attempt against uh, Kim Jong-un. Um, the, uh, the fourth story listed their biggest government hack ever. That's related to the OPM breach where um, many millions of, of um, government employees and contractors and military personnel had their um, had their uh, top secret security clearance paperwork uh, hacked, uh, along with fingerprints and you know their whole history and and you know th that's an attack f um, for which you know the repercussions will will reverberate potentially for years <clears throat> as uh, as nation states try to take advantage of the data that they discovered. Um, and then the last one there is ransomware. Ransomware has been really popular over the last couple of years, so that's something that um, is worth uh, discussing with students. So anyway, uh, high profile news stories over the last uh, couple of years. And um, again, this can all be replaced by, uh, by content that you think is more interesting. So in terms of introductory concepts, you know, I like to start out with what is cyberspace? And here are a couple of different, here are a couple of different definitions. Um, <clears throat> You know, the notional environment in which communication over computer networks occurs, right? So that, that's kind of the simple definition. You know, I, I like to, to characterize cyberspace a little bit closer to, to the definition on the bottom, although, although that definition is pretty tortured. Um, you know, it's pretty long and, and hard to, and hard to um, wrap your brain around. But really, you know, cyberspace from, from the student perspective is computing devices and the network that connects them, I think is a good uh, way to characterize it, right? Computing devices, which could be every, everything from your smartwatch to your car to your laptop to your home network, you know, whatever, um, and the networks that, that that connect these different uh, computing devices, and that could be wireless network, could be wired network, um, and both of those are are, are potential targets for uh, for attack. Um, <clears throat> the picture on the right is the book cover from a book called Neuromancer. And that's, this is, that's just a bit of sort of, um, you know, geek trivia. Um, the term cyberspace was um, coined back in uh, the mid 1980s by uh, William Gibson, who, who wrote the book Neuromancer. And uh, so Neuromancer is, is a, you know, old school science fiction um, book that is, uh, that's, I don't know, it's a pretty good book if you haven't read it. If you have students who are into uh, science fiction, this is, that's a good story. <clears throat> okay, so if, if cyberspace is computing devices and the networks that connect them, then what is cybersecurity? Well, uh, cybersecurity is, is the protection of computer systems from the theft or damage to their hardware, software, or information, as well as from disruption or misdirection of the services they provide, right? So, so um, <clears throat> this is, again, a... Um, a, a uh, you know, I think this is a Wikipedia definition. I should have a reference there. I don't have a reference. Um, but, you know, the, so the definition of cybersecurity goes beyond just, just securing the data that might be stored on a computing system, but it's also, um, it's, you know, it's not just securing data from prying eyes. You know, a lot of, a lot of students may think of cybersecurity as I'm just trying to secure my, um, credit card number and, and social security number from malicious actors, for example. <clears throat> but there's, there's um, quite a bit more to it than that. Um, you know, we care about protecting the data from prying eyes, but we also care about um, ensuring that data isn't changed in an inappropriate manner. So we don't want somebody coming in and, and changing data that, you know, people who are not authorized to do that. And we also don't want systems to be disrupted, right? So disruption could be things like uh, a denial of service attack where, you know, I, I have some critical system that I need to have access to and um, that system is no longer available because somebody's attacked it. And, and so one example of that that I, I think you can use with students is um, there's been a, a um, there's been recent attacks against the, um, against city level networks and, uh, and, or, or I guess maybe even better one is, is uh, hospitals. <clears throat> There's been malware, uh, uh, crypto malware, so ransomware attacks against hospitals um, in, the, in the very recent past. And that was 
particularly in 2017, that was a pretty popular attack. And it's, I think it's still being uh, conducted. Um, but, you know, why would, why would an attacker target a hospital with, with a ransomware attack? Well, they target, a ho they, they target um, people who, who they can be confident that are going to pay the ransom. And if you target a hospital and you, run, and you do a ransomware attack on hospital um, IT systems, then you're going to encrypt things like patient data. And that patient data is needed to do things like diagnose conditions and, um, and prescribe medications and just generally take care of patients. And so um, because the hospital relies on that patient data in order to treat patients and keep people alive, hospitals are very likely to pay uh, to, to get that data back. And so, um, so uh, <clears throat> that, that's a good example of, um, you know, nobody is trying to compromise that patient data. They're just trying to encrypt it, make it unavailable. And that's, that's a, uh, an attack on the availability of data, which is um, certainly a, 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 um, a cybersecurity issue, right? It's something that we need to protect ourselves against. So that's high level cybersecurity definition. <clears throat> and then um, I certainly always like to talk to students about the CIA triad, right? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. You'll hear this a lot in cybersecurity circles. Um, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a good framework uh, with which to think about securing uh, computers and, and data. Um, so what is confidentiality? Well. Confidentiality says that we want to protect information from disclosure to unauthorized parties. So that's pretty straightforward, right? That's that's protecting your um, uh, credit card numbers, social security number, et cetera, um, from um, malicious actors who might try to compromise that data and then um, and then you know try to open credit cards on your behalf, for example, or or you know use that credit card to buy stuff and have it shipped to somebody besides you. <clears throat> um, confidentiality, obviously very important. Integrity, ensuring that information is not altered accidentally or by entities unauthorized to make alterations. Okay, so, so how, you know, why is, why is protecting data from unauthorized alteration important? Well, think of, think of your bank account, right? You don't want an unauthorized party to log into your bank's uh, backend systems and manipulate, um, you know, manipulate account information to say that, you know, $20,000 has been removed from your retirement account and placed into somebody else's, right? So that's a, an attack that could uh, be perpetrated. And that is an attack that would modify uh, data in, in an unauthorized way. And so that's an attack on data integrity, right? It's not so much a confidentiality issue, it's somebody changing data in an unauthorized way. Um, and then the last one there is availability, right? Ensuring information can be used when and where needed. And that um, comes back to th this discussion of, of ransomware that we just had, right? How, you know, um, you, want, you want to make sure that data is available when you need it. <clears throat> okay, and so, um, so these next couple of slides just give some more concrete examples of, of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so think of Think of a, um, a system connected to uh, a Wi-Fi, you know, a wireless access point. <clears throat> and here we'll assume that the uh, wireless channel is unencrypted, right? So that's that's it's it's certainly possible to connect to what are considered open wireless access points. So wireless access points that are unencrypted um, access points in which you don't have to type in a password in order to connect. And if you do that. <clears throat> then, um, then somebody can, um, here we have our attacker Eve. Um, <clears throat> if you connect to a, um, an unsecure wireless access point, so the data between your laptop and the access point is unencrypted, that's just, um, uh, you know, it's a radio signal between two devices, right? So anybody who's within wireless proximity of that communication can eavesdrop on it and listen to it. And so Eve here can listen in on that communication. And if you transmit data like your credit card number or your social security number over that unsecure channel, then Eve could 
snatch that data right out of the air, right? So that's a, a confidentiality issue. Uh, so Eve's or Alice's connection to JFK airport Wi-Fi is not secure, and Eve can eavesdrop on the communication. Okay, how do we, you know, and then it's useful from here to get into a conversation about okay, how do we prevent this? Well, we use something like WPA2. You know, you want to you want to use encrypted wireless channels, um, and um, you know, WPA2 is the current standard, although there are other uh, um, standards out there. Now, if you have an encrypted channel, then Eve can Eve can still listen to that communication, but it's completely unintelligible, right? Because it's encrypted data. <clears throat> so here's another potential uh, attack, and this gets to integrity. Um, and so here we say, what if JFK Airport Wi-Fi isn't who you think it is? Um, so this is a man in the middle attack. Um, the example I'm given here. So here you have. Alice's laptop connecting to JFK Airport Wi-Fi, at least that's the, the um, SSID that's being advertised by Eve here. And maybe really um, <clears throat> Alice is supposed to be connecting to JFK Wi-Fi, but they're um, inadvertently connecting to this different SSID, JFK Airport Wi-Fi. And, and this is an attack that used to be fairly popular, actually. People would, people would sit in airport terminals with their laptops and advertise a, a wireless signal and um, and what you can do with this kind of a man in the middle attack is you can um, you can uh, um, basically uh, have somebody connect to you in an encrypted way and you um, receive that data decrypt it observe it and then re-encrypt it with a never another encryption key and then send it off to the real wireless access point so this is an integrity problem right somebody could accept that data, change the data, and send it on, and you may never know the difference. Um, okay, so how do, you, how do you defend against that kind of thing? Um, there's, there's, you know, you can use authentication, you can use a, a VPN, uh, you know, encrypted tunnel between your endpoint and the, and the far endpoint, different ways that you can defend against this. This would be something that you would cover over the following weeks in a cybersecurity course, not something that you would cover on this slide, but this is a, you know, a, an attack on data integrity. And then back to our same wireless uh, um, example, <clears throat> what could be an attack on availability? Well, in a wireless network um, with a strong wireless signal, Eve can jam legitimate signals in a denial of service attack. So um, this is something that um, you know you don't probably don't see very often, but it, this is certainly conceptually possible, right? If if somebody wants to disrupt a wireless uh, network. They can just jam it by um, transmitting a, a strong wireless signal on the same frequency as the as the wireless network and cause um, make it so that that uh, any um, legitimate wireless communication is overwhelmed by this jamming signal and now the wireless endpoints can't communicate. Um, and you know, wireless jamming has been around since uh, since the advent of the radio, right? So when when radios were invented that allowed um, people on the battlefield, for example, to, to communicate with each other. And it didn't take long for people to figure out that if you wanted to prevent, um, uh, you know, your adversary from communicating over wireless, then you could just have a stronger wireless signal and jam their communication. <clears throat> okay, how do we mitigate these kinds of attacks? Um, you know, a wireless d uh, distributed denial of service attack can be mitigated with, you know, with multiple, um, you know, communicating over multiple different frequencies, and actually Wi-Fi has multiple frequencies that can be used to communicate. So, um, you know, there are ways to, to mitigate this both in wireless and wired systems. And again, that's something that you would cover later on in, in the in the semester. <clears throat> um, some other useful terms from a cybersecurity context: um, an asset is stuff that we care about, information, software, hardware, bandwidth, uh, reputation, privacy, money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a threat is something that could cause an undesirable effect on an asset. <clears throat> and threats are often evaluated with respect to the CIA triad. So a threat might be, a, you know, a confidentiality threat would be something that might, um, um, you know, compromise the, the, uh, um, the secrecy of some data. Um, so your asset might be some critical piece of information like, um, you know, like here at the university we consider Student data to be, you know, sacrosanct, and we don't want we don't want malicious parties to get a hold of of um, 
information about our students. So we consider that an asset that we secure. What's a threat against that asset? Well, somebody could, a threat is that somebody could compromise the system that stores that data and um, get it, you know, able to read uh, data that they shouldn't be able to read. What's a safeguard? Well, we have lots of safeguards in our network. We do things like we encrypt data when it's at rest and when it's in transit. We um, use, um, you know, passwords on critical accounts. We use two-factor authentication for all students, staff, and faculty. Uh, we have, uh, you know, firewalls and intrusion detection systems in the network. So lots of safeguards. Um, what, what are vulnerabilities? Well, vulnerability is the absence or weak, weakness of a safeguard that could allow a threat to have an effect on an asset. Um, <clears throat> and um, so let's say, for example, you had a, a, a uh, um, you know, th there was a laptop, a, you know, a, a faculty member laptop and the laptop had the um, information about the students in that faculty member's class. And maybe that faculty member doesn't use encryption. You know, they, they sort of violate university policy. They don't encrypt the data on their laptop um, like they should. And so now you have this vulnerability that you have a, a you know, laptop that has student data on it that is not properly, you know, it has an asset on it. It's not properly safeguard, safeguarded. And now you have a threat to that data. And um, if that laptop were to be stolen, misplaced, whatever, it's possible that a malicious party could get a hold of it, read the student data off the laptop, and then do something malicious. Uh, and then uh, at the bottom there, an exploit. An exploit is a technique that takes advantage of a specific vulnerability to achieve some effect on an asset. <clears throat> and so, um, so an exploit, uh, you know, as you, as you sort of get deeper into uh, a, you know, a cybersecurity course, you might start talking about specific vulnerabilities in terms of, you know, software vulnerabilities. And these are things that are discovered when, um, you know, software is analyzed and you'll, you'll hear, um, you know, like, um, People are aware of uh, like Microsoft Patch Tuesday, for example, right? That's, that's um, you know, one Tuesday a month, Microsoft patches uh, security vulnerabilities that were, that were, that have been discovered over the previous, you know, whatever time period. And um, so vulnerabilities are, in, in that context, are, uh, are um, you know, software, um, you know, poorly written software or, some software problem that could be exploited by somebody who understands the vulnerability. And, um, you know, so, so you think in terms of software vulner vulnerabilities, then the exploits that can be used against those vulnerabilities to gain unauthorized access to a system. Um, and that would be sort of a more advanced topic area in, in cybersecurity, this whole notion of software vulnerabilities and the, and the exploits that can be used uh, to, to take advantage of those vulnerabilities. And so then if you can kind of drill in to, with the students to talk about some example threats and, and accompanying safeguards. So here, if you think of confidentiality, right? Somebody could, somebody could sniff packets, somebody could be observing wireless traffic and, and, and sniff packets, uh, um, you know, eavesdrop on, on traffic between a, a laptop and a wireless access point. And so how do you safeguard against that? Well, you use encryption between those two endpoints. Um, Somebody could grab files, right? They might, they might, uh, you know, be able to get access to a system. And um, you know, I, I sort of, you know, I use the laptop as an example. Somebody might be able to, you know, gain access to the laptop, grab files off it, and now they have, uh, they have un unauthorized access to data. How do you safeguard against that? Well, you use access controls, right? You, you, you make it so that uh, people have to log in to that computer before they can gain access to the files that are on the system. Uh, there are integrity threats listed here, spoofed emails. Um, I just had spoofed emails today, actually. A couple of emails to, were received by people that were purported to have been uh, sent by me, and uh, they weren't. And um, how do you protect against, how do you ensure that your emails that you receive are not spoofed? Well, you use digital signatures on emails. And, and uh, you know, again, that's a, that's a topic for later discussion in a, in a semester, but um, digital signatures allow you to authenticate data uh, communicated between two, two endpoints. Um, another integrity issue not, that doesn't have to do with um, 
somebody you know to, to somebody attacking a system is just the the potential for disk drive corruption right you might have a corrupted disk drive because the disk drive the, the drive fails or you might have it because you um, drop your laptop when the disk is spinning and the read head scrapes on the on the pl platter and now you have corrupted data so that doesn't have anything to do with that, somebody attacking a system but it has to do with sort of system maintenance um, and so how do you how do you safeguard against that? Well, you, have, you, know, you back up your data on a regular basis. Um, and then some av availability threats, um, you know, denial of service attack or power failure. Um, those are both threats to availability. And how do you safeguard against those? Uh, you know, for denial of service, you have redundant uh, systems so that, um, you know, lots of companies do this these days. They'll have, they'll have multiple different web servers in different locations. So if one of them is, Attacked in in this in through through a denial of service attack, then um, other copies of their web server that are running in different locations are still available. Um, and then, uh, if there's a power failure, how do you safeguard? Well, you use use backup generators, right? So, like here at the university, we have a large data center, and it's full of servers that run critical university systems. And um, if the power goes out, then there are uh, backup generators that automatically start up and keep. You know, keep the data center powered so that uh, we can we can live through um, uh, short or medium term uh, power failures. <clears throat> um, other things to discuss: um, cost, benefit, and risk. So this is useful to cover with students. Um, you know, do not devote devote more resources than the potential loss. Right? If if it costs you more to protect the system than the the value of the data on the system, then you might be going down the wrong path. Um, you know, cost of a loss, how much does it cost if I fail to maintain uh, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability? Um, you know, don't, don't ignore secondary costs like uh, incident response. You know, if, if something bad happens and you have to spend a bunch of money on incident response and that expenditure is worth more than the value of the data, then you might be going down the wrong path. Um, so this is all more, you know, gets sort of into this business decision of, um, you know what what's what's the cost of the asset you know what could be the loss if the asset is compromised and you know what proportion of that potential cost should i invest in securing that asset um you know so you, so nothing is going to be completely secure most organizations are going to secure things um, based on the potential cost of the loss and that's all those are all business decisions <clears throat> okay um Quick security fundamentals. Um, this is a good quote by Gene Spafford. Um, only truly secure system is one that's powered off, cast in a block of concrete and sealed in a lead lined room with armed guards. Um, yeah, so just kind of a tongue in cheek uh, definition. Um, but in, in reality, we, all, we often have to make lots of trade offs between security and usability. And this is something, again, that I think is useful for students to, to wrap their brain around, you know. The more secure you make something, usually the less available it's going to be, and vice versa. You know, so so if you want to protect that student data to the to you know to the utmost, well, you could just power off all systems that store that student data. But then you can never use that student data because of the systems that access it are all powered off, right? So there's always some compromise between security and availability that has to be that has to be. Um, uh, um, taken into account. <clears throat> so the, the bottom bullet there is, is useful to point out to students, you know, we cannot make perfectly secure systems, but we can make our systems more defensible. Um, you know, so there's no perfect security, um, just like in a house, right? You're never going to prevent all ways that a burglar might get into your house. You know, if you put, uh, you know, if, if you replace your wooden door with a steel door and, um, you know, a bank vault lock on it, then they could just come through a window, right? If you replace all, if you put bars on all your windows, then they could, you know, if they're really aggressive, they could bust a hole in the wall, right? Whatever. So, you know, nothing is going to be perfectly secure. It's all a trade off in accessibility and usability. Um, <clears throat> you know, a discussion about why somebody might want to attack our systems is useful. So I'll just kind of throw this slide up for what it is. Um, you know, it's not always about stealing credit card data. Sometimes it's just about using a system for an unauthorized purpose, right? So we have 
problems on campus occasionally where some malicious uh, person will attack uh, one of our on-campus systems simply so that they can use that computing power to do some malicious things. So for example, they will um, send, uh, they'll, they'll compromise a system on campus and then they will send emails out from our, uh, through our campus email server and by, by sending emails from an on-campus system through the Virginia Tech email server, um, it makes that outgoing email look more legitimate to the receiving end. And so if you want your spam messages, for example, to, to show up in somebody's email inbox instead of in their spam folder, then you can do something like you can compromise a system within a legitimate network and send outgoing emails through that system's uh, email uh, server and then those uh, those emails on the receiving end are more more likely to actually be received by the by the potential recipients, and so that's a problem that we saw a lot here on Virginia Tech a couple of years ago, and took pretty significant steps to um, to mitigate. And uh, so far, so good in terms of those mitigations. Um, so lots of reasons why systems might get attacked, not just to to steal data, but um, but sometimes just to use computing power or you know for other for other reasons. <clears throat> so I'll go really quickly through these because I do want to jump into this other slide deck really quick. Um, but uh, you know, th this, th this discussion might be more useful to a, a more advanced um, crowd, you know, uh, community college students, college students, maybe advanced, um, advanced high school students who are taking their second or third course in cybersecurity. But this gets to what it means for a system to be defensible. And um, the, the idea is we want to make our systems harder to attack, hard to attack, easy to defend. And um, so we have these four elements for defensibility. And I take these from uh, a couple of books by um, Richard Baitlick, uh, who is a um, pretty well-known uh, information security professional. Um, he was the... Um, Chief, uh, or he was the he was the ch chief information security officer for a company called um, uh, Mandiant, uh, and then Mandiant and FireEye combined, and he he became the uh, I think the chief technical officer for that company. He served in that capacity for a couple of years, and now he's with a different company. But but uh, anyway, a friend of mine, pretty good, um, pretty well known uh, infosec professional, and he uses these four elements for defensibility. So he says that systems should be controlled minimized, monitored, and current. Controlled, what does that mean? Well, um, this is about proper authentication, right? So you wanna make sure that people have to log in to systems. You wanna use multi-factor authentication when possible. You wanna have good passwords. You wanna make sure passwords are stored properly and in a way that they can't uh, easily be compromised. So that's all part of making sure systems are, that you're controlling access to systems. Um, lots of different techniques for access control. Uh, um, and some of those are listed here. Um, so make sure that, that you're using uh, proper access controls. Only authorized users should get access to certain data. And then at the bottom here, uh, I say, don't forget about physical security, right? You can, you can have all the security layers you want from a technical standpoint, but if you allow somebody to break into your server room and get physical access to your servers, then they can usually find a way to, to gain unauthorized access to your data. So don't forget about proper um, authentication for people going into the server room, for example. And that's what we do here on campus. We have a, in our data center, we have very tight um, uh, uh, access controls to, to get people, you know, to only certain people are allowed into the server room and that's done, that's, that's through multi-factor authentication. And um, so it's important, physical security is important too. Minimize, this is about reducing the attack surface, right? And so as you get into more advanced discussions uh, with, with um, students about, about uh, you know, networks and ports on devices, then you can start getting into attack services, right? So, um, you know, more open ports on a system is usually bad. You want to minimize, uh, you know, minimize the number of pathways into a system, you know, minimize the number of logical pathways into a system. And you do that by closing down, uh, um, uh, unnecessary services. You do that through packet filtering. You do that through firewalls. Um, so different, there are different ways to, to minimize the attack surface on a critical system. 
monitor? Do you want to use logs? Cap, you know, capture as much data as possible about, um, you know, anytime somebody logs in, you want to capture anytime uh, some, a, a login failure happens. It's helpful, helpful to capture that too. Um, you know, capture when certain files are manipulated, um, whatever, more logging from an incident response uh, perspective is usually best. Um, and those logs are used not only for security incidents, but also just for basic troubleshooting. Right? If something went wrong, go back through the logs, discover what happened that shouldn't have happened, and then you can go back and fix the problems. Um, and then uh, also want to monitor using like antivirus uh, and intrusion detection, monitor what's going on in the network and what's going on on different hosts. And then um, file integrity monitoring is a, a technique by which you can make sure that critical files are not uh, uh, altered in an unauthorized way. And so there are some tools that you can use to, to check the integrity of, um, you know, essentially you're on, a, you're on a hash against uh, critical files. And if those files change, then you'll be alerted and, um, and you can identify potential intrusion attempts in that way. Okay, and then current is all about keeping systems patched, um, you know, keep, uh, with, with home computer systems, um, you know, th that patching all happens in an automated way. And um, so that's not very hard, right? Keep, keep your home Windows 10 computer patched. Um, you know, that's usually uh, uh, happens automatically and you just, you're just told in the morning that your system had to reboot last night. Um, in a data center, it's much more difficult because you have critical systems that you can't just turn off for an automated patch. So you have to patch them manually. And, um, and you know, if you, have a, if you have a data center with hundreds of systems in it, then you have to have somebody, uh, um, you know, manually patching those on a regular basis. Um, you know, it's, it sounds easy. It's not as easy as it sounds, but keeping systems patched and updated is, is very important to, uh, to secure systems. Uh, okay, so I'm going to stop there with that slide deck and I'm going to jump over to another one. I'm just going to spend about five minutes on this because I, I don't have more than about five minutes. But um, again, these are cybersecurity concepts that are used by a program called GenCyber, which is an NSA uh, slash NSF, so National Science Foundation and National Security Agency. They co sponsor this GenCyber pro uh, program. And GenCyber is um, uh, cybersecurity camps that are run across the, the country, uh, 150 of them last year. I think they're shooting for more than 150 this coming summer. They happen in the summer, June, July, August. We hold one at Virginia Tech. Um, UVA holds gen cyber camps. Um, uh, New River Community College holds it. Um, James Madison University holds them. Uh, Old Dominion University holds them. So I would I would encourage you if you're a if you're either a teacher who wants to get students involved in a week-long cybersecurity camp, or if you're, you're a teacher and you want to go to a week-long cybersecurity camp, Gen Cyber is a great program for that. And um, at least at Virginia Tech, it's a five-day camp where we cover um, cybersecurity concepts and Virginia Cyber use of the Virginia Cyber Range and, and other stuff. Um, but these concepts are used in in Gen Cyber, and um, so I'm just going to talk about them very briefly. I actually like these, right? These are these are a good way to, you know, you can you can introduce students to these six cybersecurity principles. So there's only six of them, and um, and uh, it, it's just a good way to think about securing systems. And you know, it's one of those things that you can kind of drill the students over and over and talk about the cybersecurity principles. And as you talk through topic areas, you can refer back to the cybersecurity principles and talk about you know, which ones of these apply and why, and, and it's a good framework uh, in which to talk about lots of different cybersecurity concepts. So, um, <clears throat> so I, when I look at these six principles, I, I sort of like to break them up into um, two groups. So first of all, you have the desired, desired attributes, right? So you have confidentiality, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These are things that we already talked about. These are desired attributes of of our computing systems that we want to maintain. And then on the bottom, you have, you have some approaches to achieving CIA, right? So you have defense in depth, thinking like an adversary, keeping it simple, um, approaches to achieving CIA, and, I'll, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means in the next couple of slides. And we use a memory aid to, to remember these, these six principles, and then, and then you know, usually I talk about the memory aid, um, 
and then we, uh, you know, and then we do a quiz later on. And, um, so we'll start with confidentiality, right? <clears throat> we want to confidentiality. We already talked about this. Means protecting information from uh, unauthorized pro uh, parties, roughly equivalent to privacy, achieved through different means. And the memory aid from the hand is, uh, you know, you you keep your data confidential by wrapping it in a closed fist. So, so I'm securing my data in my fist. So it's confidentiality. Integrity, ensure information is not altered accidentally or in an unauthorized way. Here we, uh, you know, integrity is a pinky, pinky promise, right? So that's, that's a good way to remember this notion of integrity. Availability, ensure information can be, authorized, can be used by authorized parties when it's needed. And so here we have the, the thumbs up guy, right? This is the guy from, uh, Fallout uh, video game. So, you know, teachers, lots of teachers will recognize this. Um, <clears throat> you know, my son used to play this game a lot. Thumbs up, you know, availability, everything's good to go. Um, okay, so that's the CIA, right? Now, we're, now we'll talk about the, the ways to achieve CIA. One is defense in depth. So, um, the good way to remember defense in depth is we have rings of defense, right? So, think of the ring finger of a ring. Uh, you know, you have ringed defense, you know, defend like a castle. We have a moat, then a hill, then a wall, then you have archers, then you might have a tower. Um, you know, border firewall is the first line, et cetera, et cetera. So, so defense in depth is a, is a good approach to securing systems. Uh, think like an adversary. This is a really good one, I think. You know, you talk to students about, um, okay, here's a system. How might you attack this system? You know, think of the, think of the lock, right? For, you know, you, you, Look at, if you're thinking like an adversary and you look at that poorly designed smart lock and you turn it over and you see that there's a little tab under, on the back where you might stick a screwdriver and turn it, um, you know, that, that's thinking like an adversary. And so for memory aid, you know, you have your, your five fingers here and, and the middle one is surrounded. And we've got you surrounded. So we're thinking like an adversary here. Um, keep it simple. This is the, the, uh, the last. Um, you know, complexity, the quote I have at the bottom here, complexity is the enemy of security. So keep it simple, index finger, just remember this one thing. Um, and, you know, if you're teaching programming or you're teaching, you know, lots of different, lots of different uh, um, cybersecurity concepts are, are, you know, all sort of come back to, you know, the simpler, the better. You don't want to, you know, a, a, a simple plan executed now is better than a complex plan, you know, implemented a week from now. So, um, so those are the, the the six cybersecurity concepts and then a memory aid that goes with them. And then, um, you know, I, I talk through these again with the students and then once in a while I'll give them a quiz. So make them take out a blank sheet of paper and, um, you know, I'll show them one at a time and then they can write down what they think it is and then we can talk to the answers. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there because I have another call I gotta be on in a couple of minutes. So. Um, so thanks for joining today and this uh, recorded session. I, I probably talked kind of fast because I had uh, lots of stuff I wanted to get through. Um, in the future, I'll talk slower because I won't have quite as much material, but I, I wanted to cover um, these two uh, um, sets of slides. And these, again, are both going to be available um, in the Cyber Basics Module 1, Lesson 1 uh, uh, webpage. Um, and so you can download them. You'll be able to download them from there. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna ask if anybody has any questions. And if you do, please um, jump on the chat and I'll monitor the chat here for the next minute or two. And, and then I gotta get off and, and uh, go do something else. So thanks for, for joining today. And uh, I look forward to next week. And next week is an um, is introduction to cryptography. So thanks. <clears throat>